Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, kids, you are dismissed. The rest of you may be seated. Um, thank you, guys. And teachers, I'll, we'll bring Lord's Supper out to you as we uh, get ready for that stage. Um, <clears throat> it's important for me, especially as a father of a very young child, to make sure we are inclusive of our children in our worship and in our services. They are a part of this church family, and so we're always grateful to have them. We're grateful for what all of our teachers uh, do for them as well. Um, we're going to continue on in this series. I, I started this at the beginning of the month of March. Why do we do what we do as Christians? Um, I, I think for, for many people, and this is not a judgment or a complaint, I think it's just reality, they go to church because you're supposed to go to church. And they sing songs because you're supposed to sing songs. And they pray because you're supposed to pray. And I think even with the Lord's Supper, I think there's, there's people who just... They take the Lord's Supper because, well, that's what you do when you go to church. Um, and, and so this, this whole sermon series is, is designed around explaining, well, why is it that we do what we do, right? We sing because God gives us joy. We pray because God is alive and listens to us. We gather together that encourages us. Today, we're going to answer the question, well, why do we even bother taking this Lord's Supper? Um, again, our usual pattern, we sing songs, we take the Lord's Supper, we sing some more songs, I get up and preach. But I figured if, if I was going to preach about why to take the Lord's Supper, I would preach on that, and then we would take the Lord's Supper. Um, again, some things like parenting, you try to teach the right practice before you get the understanding behind it, right? Like you, you learn to say please and thank you, even if you don't really understand what the terms please and thank you mean. Uh, we try to get our kids to share before they actually understand even what a social environment of sharing is like and why we try to help one another. All right, I mean, Amelia almost won, and we're trying to get her, yeah, you don't take all the toys. If there's other kids, you let them play with toys. She's not understanding the why, but we're trying to teach the right practice. I feel like sometimes that's when applied to the Lord's Supper, right? Like you, you, you become a Christian, you believe in Jesus. If that's the case, then you take the Lord's Supper. And I, I want to give you, a, a, at least today, a much deeper reasoning as to why. Um, I, I think it has this beautiful meaning. I'm going to give you several reasons today. Um, and hopefully, at least one of them will stick so that when you leave today, if you don't have a great reason why you always take the Lord's Supper today, you will walk away with at least one, maybe upwards of five reasons you take the Lord's Supper. Uh, I'm going to do this uh, in a, kind of a, a different format we're going to work through the gospel. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the three synoptic gospels, they all share a very similar story. Some slight differences. I'll touch on some of the differences, but they all share a very similar story. It's Matthew 26. It's Mark 14. It's Luke 22. I'm just going to read from the Luke account, but when I walk through some of the reasons why we take the Lord's Supper, I'll have all the verses from each of the three gospels accounts. I'll put those up there. Um, but we're, we're going to read through Luke. Once I read through Luke's account, uh, again, I'll, I'll talk to you about the Gospels. The Apostle Paul, he's going to write to a church in Corinth years down the line about the Lord's Supper as well. And I think he provides some really good teaching and insight there. So the way we're going to do this, this sermon, Lord's Supper, is this. Well, I'll walk us through the Gospels. I'll share some reasons I think Jesus gives for why we take the Lord's Supper. Then I'm going to walk us through Paul and give the reasons why Paul says, actually, we don't take the Lord's Supper for these reasons. We do take it for these reasons. So we'll look at Paul. Then I'll actually lead us in our Lord's Supper remembrance. If you want to follow along, we're going to read at least from the Luke account. This is Luke chapter 22, starts in verse 14, goes through verse 20. This is how Luke writes about the Lord's Supper. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 
All right, I'm going to just share kind of briefly the what before I get to the why, right? The what is the Lord's Supper. Matthew and Mark tell a very similar story to this. The Lord's Supper, as we take it, as I read it from here, it's all centered around the Passover meal. So again, a brief history. I preached on the Passover not too long ago, um, but the Jews were slaves in the nation of Egypt, and Pharaoh, who's the, the king of Egypt, wanted to keep them as his slaves. Well, God was using Moses as his prophet and leader to bring the people out of Egypt. And Pharaoh continued to deny his slaves um, to leave Egypt. And so Moses, God through Moses, begins casting these plagues on Egypt. And so there is darkness and there is uh, gnats and flies and locusts and sores and it's, it's... terrible things, then comes a night of complete darkness that turns into a day that still has complete darkness. And then you get to the very final plague, the 10th plague that was cast. And this is where an angel of death is going to sweep through Egypt. And so Moses is told by God, this is what's going to happen. An angel of death is going to come through. So Moses tell the people of Israel, if they don't want to have the angel of death visit their house, they must kill a lamb and put the blood over the doorposts and the sides. And then the angel of death will, as the keyword shows, pass over the house. That's the process. And so this this happens. The angel of death came through. If you did not have the blood marking your house, then the angel went into the house and killed the firstborn. If you had the blood protecting your house, you were spared. And so the angel passed over the people of Israel in this final plague. This then became a traditional remembrance for the people of Israel. Every single year at the time of the Passover, they would remember that they were spared this plague because of the blood of the covenant, this blood that has been set forth. The angel passed over and spared them. So this is the meal in which Jesus is now giving this Lord's Supper. You can see some of the spiritual undertones that fit for us. Jesus is going to become our blood. And now when God looks the blood of Jesus that is spilt on the cross, he is going to pass over judgment upon us because the blood of Jesus protects us. So the Lord's Supper is going to fit very timely with this actual practice of the Passover meal. Let me talk about the two emblems for a moment. We have bread and we have fruit of the vine. You hear that red within the passage. The bread is traditionally unleavened bread. We get this from the book of Exodus. That's why uh, we continue this practice of unleavened bread. The bread really doesn't matter all that much. The elements, uh, and this might be different for some of you. As far as biblical teachings are concerned, the elements are not the important part. You can eat this as a snack if you so chose. Most of you would not choose mass-produced styrofoam-tasting crackers. But if you did, you could eat that as a snack. And you can drink juice with, I don't really like grape juice all that much, I'll confess. But if you like grape juice, you can sit and drink grape juice. It's not the body or the blood of Jesus when you just want a snack, right? This has special significance when we gather together as a collective body. We focus on Jesus that's when this becomes important. Any other time, this is just sitting in a box, it's sitting on a stand, it's sitting on a shelf ready to be sold all throughout the world. This is just bread and juice. To us, this means something a lot more. When we take it together, these emblems become so much more significant. By themselves, it's, it's just bread and juice. Because of Jesus and what he's done, when we gather together and say, hey, let's reflect on the Lord's Supper, then this becomes important, okay? So that's the what's of the Lord's Supper. Now let me start giving you some of the why. So Jesus is going to give us three reasons, I believe three reasons within these gospel accounts. Jesus gives three reasons why we continue to take the Lord's Supper today. The first is that it is a reminder that Jesus will drink it in the future. Uh, I really appreciate Mike's selection of songs because we, we were already singing some of this within our songs before I got up here. Uh, Phrases like, until he comes, and we'll get to that in a little bit, um, that particular coming of Jesus again. 
But, but Jesus is going to talk about, I'm not, this is his last night on earth. So again, just the timing of the Passover meal before the crucifixion. Like this is Jesus's final night on earth before the crucifixion. He says, I'm not going to eat the bread. I'm not going to drink the cup. I'm not going to do this again until I do it in the future. So I think I have all three gospel accounts. Let's pull this up. So this is Matthew, Mark's, and Luke's version. They're all very, very similar. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I particularly like Matthew's emphasis here. Mark says, very similar though, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And then what we read in Luke, I tell you, I will not eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. The gospels all agree. And this is, this is one of the, the beautiful aspects of the Bible. Like there are plenty of spiritual texts out in the world that are not anywhere near as coherent. The Bible is a very coherent story where it, it works together. They don't work apart. It works together. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're all saying the same thing. When Jesus sat down for this Passover meal, he said, I'm not going to do this again until I do it with you. So because of that, there is actually a teaching within this. For Jesus to drink this again, he must be alive. For Jesus to eat this again, he must be alive. When we take the Lord's Supper, it is actually a teaching and a reason for us to believe Jesus still lives. We believe he died on a cross. And that's why this becomes blood and, and body. And that's why this has significance. But he didn't stay dead. Now, I'll talk about this a lot next week for Easter Sunday. You guys know I love Easter Sunday. It's my favorite Sunday of the year. We'll, we'll talk a lot about the resurrection and the crucifixion next week. But that's one of the reasons the Lord's Supper is so significant to us. The Gospels agree Jesus is alive now. And he will eat and drink this again in the future. We, second, second reason, right? First reason we anticipate Jesus will do this again. Second reason I think Jesus gives for this. He says, do this in remembrance of me. We do this every single Sunday. Not every church does. Um, I'll make a very brief aside to say there is no scriptural command to say, take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. You can get the teaching of take it as often as you come together, which that could be every single day of the week if you wanted it to be. We know disciples met together on Sundays. I talked about this last week, but there's, you will find no scriptural reference that says take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. That's just not in there. But man, I love taking this every single Sunday because we do this in remembrance of Jesus. Remember, what's one of the reasons that we gather together as a congregation? It is to keep our faith encouraged. Who is our faith in? Our faith is not in the Bible. Our faith is in the living God. She gave us the Bible. I get that. But our faith is, is not in words. Our faith is in a living God. Our particular faith is in a resurrected Jesus. Man, why should we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? It gives us an opportunity to remember Jesus. If you remember when I preached last week about why we gather, I said, man, there's a lot of reasons to gather. Sometimes the church gathered for particular reasons, right? Paul was coming in giving missionary reports. They had to make sure the widows were taken care of. Sometimes the church has other things to do. We need to do those things. I think there's a biblical precedence to do the important things. Man, if we do the Lord's Supper every single week, even if we're doing other things that are just as important, we are always taking time to remember Jesus. We'll go ahead and pull up the Luke 19 passage, right? He takes the bread, he gives it to them, he breaks it, says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's interesting, Matthew and Mark don't use this phrase, uh, but this teaching continues through the church because we'll read this again when we get to 1 Corinthians, which makes perfect sense um, because Paul, who writes the book of 1 Corinthians, spends a fair amount of time with Luke, who writes the gospel account of Luke, Paul and Luke spent a lot of time together in the book of Acts. It makes sense that when Paul teaches people about the Lord's Supper, he's going to quote Luke's version of the Lord's Supper. That all kind of works hand in hand to me. But we do this in remembrance of Jesus. 
uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, there are times, especially growing up as an immature teenager, um, you know, there's songs, Lord's Supper, more songs, sermon, invitation, prayer requests. Man, when the person gets up for the Lord's Supper and they just keep going and they keep going and they keep going and keep going and keep going, like, especially as a teenager, I was, I was like, come on, I'm, I'm hungry. This is not going to satisfy my meal. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But like, I'm, I'm, there's football to watch. I'm a big football guy. Football's going to start. I need to make sure my, my family wants to go out to eat. So I got to make sure we get home before the game starts. And if you're going to take 15 minutes of the Lord's Supper, that's just too long. And immature teenage Caleb sometimes struggled with, why do we spend so long? Uh, I, I would argue a little bit mature Caleb has at least said, man, we could spend as long as we want on this. This we do in remembrance of Jesus. And again, it, it, it connects to the whole gospel story uh, about the death and the resurrection, that he's still alive. But we do this for Jesus. Um, if we come to church just to say hi and eat food and have fun, we're doing church wrong. I'll, just, I, I'll be very blunt and honest. If church is about fun and friendship, go join a country club. This is not the place for fun and friendship as the sole reason you gather. It's part of why we gather. We do have fun, but man, we gather for Jesus, right? All the other stuff, it, it's bonuses and it's sides. Why does the church gather? We gather for Jesus. We remember Jesus. The reason Jesus is so important, we do this in remembrance of him. We think about when he comes again. The reason this is also important is the third reason that Jesus gives. It's because this is part of the new covenant. See, we value the Old Testament. There's 39 books in the Old Testament. This is the time of God with his people Israel. We value that. Very important. We are not people of the Old Testament. Uh, another word for testament is covenant. That might actually be a better translation of that word is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We do not exist under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant says, here is Abraham. Here are his descendants. If you are Abraham or his descendants biologically, then you are part of the Old Covenant. I am not, I'll just put that as a disclaimer. I know that you, know, you may not think that, but I am not a Jew. Therefore, I do not qualify as a part of the Old Covenant. I could get kind of a second ranking. I could be a proselyte, which means I believe in the Jewish teachings but no matter how fervently I believe in the Jewish teachings, I will never be equal to a full Jew. Like that's just the way the covenant works. There is the covenant, which is God's people with the Jews. Jesus comes along, and Jesus is going to change that. And he's going to establish a new covenant. No longer is it about the biology of coming from Abraham. Now it is about, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? We go through this practice of baptism where it literally does that, right? We tend to ask the question, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you take him as your Lord and Savior? We go down in the water. We come up out of the water. That is symbolically, as Paul puts it, like this blood of Jesus covering us, being put in fresh garments. It is being a member of the new covenant. And that's, that's why the fruit of the vine... The, the grape juice, it doesn't really matter if you're using wine or grape juice. It's kind of whatever you want to use. But again, the emblems are not as important as what it speaks of. We speak of the new covenant. We are part of the new covenant. Do you know what it means to be a part of the new covenant? Let's go ahead and pull up those verses. Jesus explains it when he gives the new covenant. You can't ask for a better teacher than Jesus sometimes. Uh, most of the time. All the time? We'll just say all the time. Jesus is the greatest teacher. Matthew 26. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Mark's account, he says to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And obviously in Luke, as we read, likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. I get it. Blood is gross and inappropriate in most cultural conversations. You don't normally talk about blood unless you're talking about good steak. We can talk about that later. But you don't normally talk about blood. Right? Blood is just, eh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. I get queasy when I think about blood sometimes. I don't, I don't like talking about blood. Blood of Jesus. There's a reason we talk about this. It means so much to us. 
it's not just a story to us. It is a covenant. This is why I am saved from my sins. Church, I confess I've, I've committed a lot of sins in my life. My brain is not a very good brain. My actions are not very good actions. My words are not always good words. I've committed the sins. There's no way I'm getting out of this. There is no land in Monopoly and get out of jail free if you roll doubles. This is not going to work. If you want forgiveness of sins, there is one way and one way only. The blood of Jesus. The blood of the new covenant. Jesus gives us three reasons. Why do we take the Lord's Supper? We anticipate getting to take it with him in the future kingdom. He is coming and, and he is saying, do this in remembrance of me. This gives us a way to focus on Jesus. <clears throat> and it's a way to highlight. This is part of the covenant. We are members of the blood of the covenant of Jesus. We have forgiveness of sins. I could end the sermon here. We could end services a little early. I chose not to do that because I think there's two extra good reasons in 1 Corinthians. Um, we can go ahead. I think the next slide is 1 Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'll give you a brief background before I read this. The Corinthian church was a church that was doing some really good stuff and some really not good stuff. I am really grateful historically that the Corinthians struggled because we would not have the book of 1 Corinthians if they were a bunch of perfect Christians. The reasons that they have messed up have prompted Paul to write to them which has then been saved for us. So we get much better insight into the Lord's Supper because 2,000 years ago, the church of Corinth, they really struggled with the Lord's Supper. They weren't doing some things right. And you're going to see it as I read this. But Paul says, this is why you don't do the Lord's Supper. This is why you do the Lord's Supper. So let's, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. He says, in the following instruction, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you, do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgments about the other things. I will give directions when I come. Okay. Again, it's unfortunate that the church in Corinth did it wrong. It's fortunate for us that we get some correction and some training and some insight into this process. I want to give you two reasons Paul specifically says you should not take the Lord's Supper. Then I'll give you the two reasons that he says he does. Number one, you don't take the Lord's Supper in substitution of a meal. Now, you can take the Lord's Supper in much more than just a little cracker and a little bit of juice, right? You, you can eat a full loaf, each of you. You can each have a full goblet, each of you. That's fine. That's, that's not a bad thing. Here's the problem for the church in Corinth. There were people who came to church 
and they didn't eat ahead of time because when they did the Lord's Supper, they had lots of bread and lots of wine, and they treated the Lord's Supper as a free meal. This is not meant to be your free meal. This is not the reason we do it so tiny. We do this so tiny because the world has gotten very populated. There's lots of people. It's more time efficient. It's more cost effective for us to do this in small portions. That wasn't an issue for Corinth. When they gathered together, they had a nice big Lord's Supper meal. That would have been okay, except for the people came in and they said, oh, Brother Joe ain't here. Let's time to eat. And they would eat all the bread. Then Brother Joe shows up. He's got no Lord's Supper for him. And Sister Mary over here says, I'm just going to drink all the wine. And Sister Margaret shows up and, well, there's no Lord's Supper juice for her. Some of them were, were getting drunk over this. That's reason number two. He says, not only is this not a meal, you don't take the Lord's Supper for personal pleasure. Uh, again, church, you guys should know, I love food. I love drink. It is good to enjoy the blessings that God has made. When I drink my morning coffee, I'm often going, mm, 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 it's so good. When I'm, I, you guys know I like to make bread. When I make bread, then I eat my bread. Mm, it's so good. Come together for the Lord's Supper. I understand most of us are not going to eat this cracker in a minute and go, mm, 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 it's so good. That's not how most of us do this. But people at Corinth, they kind of were. God, man, I haven't had a whole bottle of wine myself in ages. This is so good. Paul says, like, when you do this, like, you're not doing the blood of Jesus. You're not doing the body of Jesus. You're drinking wine. You're eating bread. You're not doing the Lord's Supper. If that's the case, he said, just don't do it, please. Just stop. All right, so the, the writer of the book of Malachi, when, when he writes, the people of Israel are doing offerings so bad. They're, they're bringing broken animals up to the altar. They're bringing blind animals. They're, they're doing the offering system so bad the, the writer, the prophet Malachi says, I wish y'all would just stop offering sacrifices to God. It is so bad what you're doing. In fact, I wish someone would just shut the doors. It's a little bit what Paul is saying. If you are going to abuse the Lord's Supper, just don't take it. If, if you're going to come in and you want to get drunk and eat food, and not to mention there's, there's this issue of you're doing this without the body. Again, the Lord's Supper has significance without the body again the lord's supper has significance because of the assembled body if you're doing church before half the church gets there that's a problem historically i think there's an understanding that it was the wealthier who got to the church of corinth first their slaves were still doing the chores back home but slaves could also be christians so the masters were getting drunk and eating the lord's supper and then the slaves came to church afterwards and they had nothing whether or not that's the exact scenario that put this in, the reality is they were not doing this all equal. That's a problem. So I think Paul is then teaching us the correct way. He gives us two reasons we should do the Lord's Supper. Number one being, this highlights the unity of the body. I'm the minister. We have elders here. We have certain degrees of influence and authority and decisions that we make. We are going to take the exact same amount of bread and juice as you guys are. We have Bible class teachers with years of experience and wisdom, and they're going to take just as much bread and blood as you are. Um, we have people who are recently baptized. We have people who have been baptized for decades and decades. They're going to take just the same amounts of the bread and the cup. The Lord's Supper is almost like this great spiritual equalizer. I don't care how educated you are. I don't care how how smart you are with the Bible. I don't care what degrees you have. When you come together for the Lord's Supper, you are just part of the body. Jesus is the head, and you are part of the body. All of us are going to take the same equal amount. Every gender, every social norm and boundary, all of that is brought together, and you are just one body with the Lord Jesus. When we come together, it highlights the unity of of the body we might sit in groups with our friends we might sit with people like us but when we take the lord's supper it's no longer about what we look like no longer about who we are around it is about the lord jesus and everyone who takes this lord's supper we are proclaiming that we are one body under jesus but we also proclaim one more thing this is the second teaching of paul when we take the lord's supper we are proclaiming the lord's death until he comes again i love that we got to sing that as a song before this until he comes 
we take this Lord's Supper. Um, it is a really just kind of cool fun fact to me, this word proclaim. It's the same word for preach, same word for gospelizing. Um, you are literally, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are doing what I am doing up here. I get up here and I preach. As you sit in the pews, you're eating this bread, drinking this cup, you are actually preaching as you do this. To everyone in the room, to anyone in the world who knows that you are a Christian and you do this, you are preaching a message that you believe Jesus has died. His blood has been spilt. His body has been broken. And you are proclaiming his death and that you believe Jesus is coming back. Every time you take the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming, you are preaching. You don't have to have training. You don't have to have eloquence. You don't even have to speak a word. But when we eat this and we drink this, we are testifying and preaching the Lord Jesus will return. And we are doing this as one body, and we're preaching it for all to see. Let me recap these five reasons for you. I'll pray, and we'll, we'll take these emblems. We take the Lord's Supper. If you only remember one of these five, I would still be happy with that. If you can remember all five, I think these are great reasons why we do this. We take this Lord's Supper. It's a reminder that Jesus is alive, and he will do this again in the future. We do this to remember Jesus. So as we eat, we do this traditionally, culturally silent other churches will play music in the background. Sometimes they will have slides in the background with the cross or the grave. There's, there's a lot of different ways to take it. No matter how you take it, the focus needs to be on Jesus. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. Not to check something off of our list. Say, make sure we got to say our prayers, sing our songs, do our Lord's Supper and get out of here. Like, no, we do this for the remembrance of Jesus. The reason we remember Jesus, and it's so important, this is part of of the new covenant. We are people of the new covenant. Every single one of us who have been brought into faith with Jesus as Lord and Savior, we are part of the new covenant, the body and the blood. That's why the blood is so important to us. It highlights the unity of our body. Every one of us, we can speak different languages. We can dress different. We can talk different. We can be different. We are all one body as we take this Lord's Supper. And we are preaching and proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus has died. This is true. But as we say in point one, he's also alive and he will return. And we take this bread and we drink this cup because we believe these truths. I'm going to offer a prayer just as Jesus did. And then we'll take our bread together and we'll, we'll spend some silence for us just to remember Jesus together. I'll say a second prayer and we'll drink the cup. And again, we'll just have some silence for a minute. Um, when I get off stage, I'll invite Mike to come up to lead us in song. I'm going to take some Lord's Supper packets over to our teachers and pray with them. Um, but for now, we're going to focus. If we can just leave this slide up on, on screen. If you find this as a way to help you focus on the Lord's Supper, you can reread some of these points. If you want to sit there, eyes closed, you can do that. If you want to read through the scriptures, you can read through the scriptures. I'm going to say a prayer. We'll take the bread together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the body of Jesus the body that was broken on our accounts when it should have been our bodies on that cross. We thank you for his body that replaced our body. And we thank you for his body that is still alive in heaven, this resurrected body. That is a promise that he will do this again in the future with us. Father, we, we pray that this is a moment we can reflect on our Lord Jesus, that we can truly remember him, and that as he returns one day, we will celebrate because of the significance of his body. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Continue in prayer here as we reflect on the cup. Our Lord God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that has been spilt. 
the blood that was shed on, on our account. And again, it should have been our blood spilt for our sins. Father, we thank you for the blood of the new covenant. This blood that, that preaches to the world as, as we drink of this little cup. That preaches that Jesus will return and that his blood has offered us forgiveness of all of our sins. Not just some, but all of our sins have been cleansed by this blood. Father, we thank you for Jesus and that sacrifice. We focus on him as we take this. Father, we thank you for the unifying aspect as one body that we get to celebrate this one blood shed for all. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mike, I'm going to invite you when you're ready if you want to come lead.